Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 15th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the Ninth Circuit's decision staying Conoco's Willow development raises longer-term concerns. We discuss what those are. Second, we need alternative revenues to substitute for PFD cuts. But how do we avoid them adding to spending? And third, our take on the current House DIS organization. And now, let's join Michael. First uh, item on uh, today's agenda is this decision uh, on the Willow Project, which some people have likened back to the uh, to some of the executive orders that Biden laid out. But this was really kind of a separate deal. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has halted the work. Uh, and I noticed that you've taken a couple people uh, out on the details of that. But go ahead and let's talk about that as number one. Well, let's 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 start by by identifying what this is. This is not a Biden decision. The Trump administration, ConocoPhillips had applied for a number of permits related to its uh, Willow project. A very important project. It's uh, 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 projected to produce about 160 million barrels a day, 160,000 barrels a day, excuse me, uh, which is what roughly um, 30 some odd, 30 some odd percent of uh, of current production. It would offset the declines that we expect to see uh, from Prudhoe and other areas uh, in the coming decade, uh, and is an important replacement project for. Uh, for that decline. So Conoco had, uh, it's on federal lands, it's in NPRA, um, and so Conoco had applied to the federal government for a number of permits related to uh, uh, related to the project. One of those uh, was to uh, mine some gravel uh, uh, in connection with the project, to, to put gravel on down for some roads and put gravel down for some pads uh, and provide a, a, a solid, uh, uh, ice-free base to, to be able to use for uh, uh, use for the project, um, and the Trump administration had uh, granted uh, all of the permits that Conoco had applied for, some with uh, conditions, but had uh, granted all of the permits Conoco had applied for, uh, up to and including uh, the gravel permit. Various entities um, uh, representing various uh, 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 groups, including. Uh, some uh, uh, living in the area of the Willow Project uh, had appealed those uh, decisions by the Trump administration, claiming that they weren't fully uh, uh, compliant with the law in terms of assessing the the, the uh, environmental uh, impact of those decisions. Um, the one on gravel uh, had gone to uh, uh, the local uh, the local district court, federal district court, Judge Gleason had reviewed it, uh, had found that it complied uh, with the um, with the law and, and approved the uh, uh, permit, uh, but that was appealed. And here's where it gets a little odd. Um, Judge Gleason then, uh, the, the, the normal process is if you want to stay the, the, the effect of the permit, uh, pending uh, pending appeal, uh, you go to the judge uh, and ask for a stay, and then you go to uh, the the 
it, it, if the judge denies it, you go to the circuit court and ask for a stay. When, uh, uh, despite the fact that she had found that the that the permit complied with the law, uh, and that it was an appropriate um, uh, action by the by the Trump administration to approve the permit. When the plaintiffs uh, uh, ask for a stay, uh, Judge Gleason granted a short stay, which is odd because the standard for a stay is is irreparable harm uh, and the expectation that uh, that you will prevail on 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 appeal or on on the decision. Right. And notwithstanding the fact Judge Gleason had found that uh, they that the that the permit was appropriate, uh, she nevertheless granted the stay, and then. She granted a short-term stay pending the decision of the Ninth Circuit on the stay, and uh, and then the Ninth Circuit has 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 extended the stay, finding that there's a likelihood of uh, that the Ninth Circuit will reverse the decision uh, on uh, on legal grounds that they'll find that the that the Trump administration wasn't didn't act appropriately uh, and reverse the decision. So granting a stay so that there, the action doesn't occur pending the pending the outcome. Uh, of the appeal, so it's it's an odd it's an odd situation. By the Biden administration to this point has has not become involved um, in it at all. Conoco announced the consequence of the stay uh, was that they would not be pursuing any willow activity, any on ground willow activity uh, uh, during the remainder of this season. So you'll recall during the fall campaign, during the the Proposition One campaign, Conoco had said, "Look, you know, we need to defeat Prop One." Uh, or else we won't go forward with the uh, with the the activity that we that we uh, have planned for Willow uh, in the in the winter and spring. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to be in that situation anyway. We're not going to go forward with the activity. Yeah. Here's here's the thing that concerns me. Now that we have a change in administrations, the Justice Department, which defends the government uh, on uh, these matters, uh, will change out. And it'll be the Biden Justice Department that is appearing for the government in front of the Ninth Circuit. It's not clear. The, the Biden administration has said that they will continue to grant permits uh, on existing leases, that they would not halt the granting of permits. But they haven't said what, what terms and conditions or what standards they may apply uh, in granting those permits. A lot of people haven't been concerned about that because – the 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 oil companies had all these permits in hand, had sort of stockpiled these permits. So they the expectation was we would just go forward with those with the with the activities as permitted, and we wouldn't have to worry about the Biden administration's what standards the Biden administration is going to apply for a while. But this this creates a problem in the sense that the Biden administration will set will will step into the shoes of representing the government for the Ninth Circuit. I would not be shocked. If the Biden administration uh, Justice Department doesn't take the position that, well, maybe maybe the maybe the government did screw up here. Let's give us back the give us back the uh, the permit and we'll consider the additional factors that that we think maybe we should have taken into account and 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 essentially withdraw the permit and and put it back in the administration's hands. Um, And and then, you know, it's sort of like the, the House organization. We don't know where it goes then. Because the Biden administration may be coming out with new standards for for new permits uh, that uh, that that they would apply to new permits requests or re- new permit requests for development on federal lands, and it may take them a while to develop those. The concern I have is that we may find Willow, which was on track, had stockpiled the permits, was was going down the road of development. Uh, we may find Willow sort of put into a never never land for uh, a period of time as the Biden administration comes to terms with with the uh, sort of this 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 reverse um and uh, and and that's not a good thing because every day that you're not able to invest in a project that means the the sort of the dollars that you'd otherwise intended to go forward with on that project uh potentially could go someplace else to another project that's going forward right and with the acquisition of Concho the completed acquisition of Concho, Conoco has become a big player in the Permian. With oil prices going up, we may see development in the Permian uh, start again, uh, and uh, and and we may see sort of a, 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 a 
th this this creating a, a a situation where Conoco's attention gets diverted away from Willow, and it may be depending upon how long the Biden administration takes to to deal with this, and depending upon what terms and conditions they come they come back with, we may find a situation where a project that we thought was going forward um, uh, becomes somewhat uh, questionable. So, again, and, and this is strictly coming about because this is on federal lands and this is what's going on. This doesn't affect the state of Alaska on their pro uh, projects that are on <clears throat> state land. But, again, any any project that's on federal land right now, I'm sure everybody's looking at it through a microscope trying to decide whether or not they're going to shut those down as, you know, as well uh, through some kind of legal loop loophole or through, again, review or discussion on this. So this is this. I mean, this has true impacts. We were talking about a 600 million barrel field, uh, you know, over the next 25 or 30 years. Conoco has already announced that they were laying off 100 people not related to Willow. But Willow itself was supposed to employ another 100 people on top of that. So, I mean, this is going to have a true impact on us. Yeah, it's 160,000. I mean, this is this is there are two major fields that we've talked about on the show before. There's two major fields that really do a lot to determine uh, Alaska's oil future. One is Willow. The other is the Pika project that Oil Search has got. And this is a 160,000 barrel field. This this is this is a this is a major replacement for the decline that we otherwise anticipate. And there's and there's you know, there's sort of a. a, a a sense of when you have a field like this, it it will it will spin off other activities sort of related to it, you know, improvements in Kaparik or 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 actions uh, elsewhere that that are sort of ancillary to it, um, or or you can afford because you've got this big project underway. If you take this big project under uh, uh, out from underneath, uh, you start questioning those uh, things as well. The the one the one thing that the layoffs yesterday. Uh, or the layoffs announced yesterday have to do with this is they 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 are the result of the Concho acquisition, uh, and as we talked on the show at the time the Concho acquisition was announced, it's going to divert some of Conoco's attention uh, down to the Permian because they've made this ba big investment in the Permian and they've now you know told Wall Street this is this is a major focus of the company. And the hundred the the layoff of the hundred is a is part of Concho and part of sort of the refocus excuse me, refocusing of the company. So, I mean, that sort of, that sort of adds to the concerns I have. If Willow gets stalled because of this, um, and we're just talking about gravel, a gravel permit, but if Willow gets stalled because of this, um, uh, as I say, Conoco's got other things that they've, that they've invested in other things that they're, that they're, that they, that they want to make a major focus of the company, other things, given the increase in oil price, that may uh, may become economically attractive that weren't uh, at lower oil prices. So it's a it, it, it's this issue is bigger than just this one permit that's that's going to be hung up. This issue, what we're going to be what I'm going to be following is is how Biden how the Biden administration responds to that. Which again we know I mean the Biden administration is not directly responsible for the stoppage, but they've already basically said they don't want any of this to happen. I mean that's already come out and that's you know the so. They're definitely not going to have the. They're definitely not going to be our friends on this when it comes down to it. Uh, when it's all said and done, um, <clears throat> Dale, I think synopsizes some of the things you were saying earlier. If Willow is going to be a major pain in the ass for Conoco, they could very well move their efforts elsewhere and out of Willow on and and out of Willow onto the back burner, not cancel it, but wait for a better political climate, which of course again delays the project for Alaska's. And I don't know if there's a time frame on some of those permits and other things that they have to they can't wait the clock out on, but I think it's a valid point. Yeah, the permits are are for uh, I think they're two years. You can you can renew them for two more or something like that. Um, so there is a there is a clock on on how long those permits stay around. But I but I think that's I think that's I think that's a problem. It, it in in the old days in the pre-Concho days, Conoco had presence elsewhere, but there was nothing like Alaska. Um, now they have a presence elsewhere and they can put their money elsewhere, and that's. That, that's a problem. It's a competition for dollars. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? There's only so many dollars that are available to invest, and it's like it flows to the path of least resistance. And if the Concho projects and the Concho uh, portfolio is more uh, is more attractive for those dollars and easier to use, then that's what they'll do. Yep, and and they are easier to use. Uh, most of the Concho 
leases are on private lands down in the Permian Basin. Uh, the uh, the the time from investment to uh, cash flow from uh, on on, uh, on 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 shale projects is just is is so much better. So it's a it's a competitive threat. Good pl- good way to put it. So that's number one on our weekly top three. Uh, number two, Brad, you want to give us a tease here? We got about a minute and a half here before we uh, jump away to break. So uh, give us a lay it out for us here before you give us deeper analysis. Well, this is the one you took a deep breath on before you before you listed uh, uh, as one of this morning's <laughs> topics. Paul Jenkins in the weekend's uh, uh, Anchorage Daily News uh, had a column, uh, Paul Jenkins being a conservative col- columnist uh, in the Anchorage Daily News, had a column that uh, the title is, Is an Income Tax Necessary for Alaska? How Can We Trust It Would Be Used Responsibly? Well, we're, we're going to discuss this. Uh, I, I'm going to start with the point that we already have an income tax. That's what PFD cuts are, uh, and that's not really so. It's not it's not really the right focus of of Jenkins' question, but he's got a question in there that I think is is important to focus on, and we're going to spend some uh, some time discussing that. We were uh, just uh, talking uh, about Paul Jenkins' opinion piece. <clears throat> excuse me, opinion piece in the ADN. Is an income necessary for now, and how can we trust it would be used responsibly? Which I think is one of the biggest. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest questions that many Alaskans have. That hey, even if we give the legislature more money, what's to say that they're going to spend it responsibly? I mean, they've done such a bang up job with the money they've been given so far, uh, Brad. I think that's uh, is that the crux of Jenkins' argument here. Well, the crux of Jenkins' argument is, is wrong. The, the crux of Jenkins' argument is we have a choice about whether we're going to have uh, the state's going to have an income tax uh, or not. And, and, and the, the, the problem with that, the reason that's wrong is we've had an income tax for the last five years. Uh, it started in 2016 in terms of PFD cuts. It's continued six, since 2016. PFD cuts are the diversion of income from the private sector to government. That's the classic definition of a tax. It's a classic definition of an income tax. Um, and there is no scenario. We're going to continue to have an income tax. There, when you look at the the fiscal plan going forward, even even Governor Dunleavy admits that there's about a billion dollar hole a year per year, the remainder of this decade and beyond, uh, uh, in the state's uh, uh, fiscal situation. That's after he proposes 400 million dollars uh, in cuts annually. That uh, the the Senator Stedman, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, has already said is is dead on arrival. So, even if if you if you even if you take into account the governor's proposed uh, spending cuts, you still have a billion dollars a year in deficit that's going to be filled in some fashion, and it's going to be filled in some fashion by an income tax. I mean, an income tax isn't just a progressive income tax; all taxes are income taxes of one form or another because that's what you pay them out of. You pay them out of income. Uh, we call them different things because they're structured differently. We call a, 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 a tax on on the portion of your income you use to consume a sales tax. We call uh, a tax on the portion of your income that comes from PFDs, PFD cuts, uh, but they're all income taxes. They're all uh, uh, dollars that are being diverted uh, to government uh, out of your out of out of your income stream, and that's going to continue. Anybody who thinks that 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 we're going to escape this fiscal situation, given what we did the last ten years by running our our savings into the ground, anybody who thinks we're going to escape over the next ten years without some form of of income tax is just wrong. What so I so that part of of Jenkins uh, uh, op ed is just in. It, frustrating to me because it's just another time when people you know are out there saying oh we can avoid an income tax we can't we we, we are going to have a tax of some uh, of of some part the part of Jenkins uh, uh piece though uh and and the part that Michael you've stressed I think over the over the last year or so uh is is something that I've come back to um uh, and have been as as a result of your questions, I've been thinking about deeper. And this is this is how it plays out in Jenkins' piece. Would lawmakers simply use a new income tax to ramp ramp up spending, given the history of Alaska's legislature? That's a fair question. 
that history is rife with fiscal recklessness. And I think, I think as I start to talk about this in the future, and as we start to think about this in the future, uh, I've mentioned this on the show before, but I, I need to, I need to add it as, as, as a, as a repeated piece uh, every time I bring up the fact that we're going to have to pay an income tax. I think as a part of, of the fiscal solution going forward, we need an effect. We need to include an effective spending cap and constitutionalizing uh, the PFD. Constitutionalizing the PFD would take off, would take away the option of using uh, uh, PFD cuts, ad hoc PFD cuts, uh, as a sort of a supplemental tax uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to fund government. Um, and a spending cap, an effective spending cap, a, a revenues-based spending cap, as opposed to a spending-based spending cap, a revenue-based spending cap, would would effectively, I think, limit uh, the ability of government to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to to uh, use addition, use revenues as as a means of of expanding uh, expanding government spending. So I, I I guess I guess the thing I want to take away from uh, uh, Jenkins Jenkins piece and from our conversations in the past is is two things. One, we are going to pay a tax. People need to understand that. They need to get their arms around that to start talking about what type of tax is most equitable and has the lowest adverse impact on the overall economy. Those are the important considerations about a tax. We need to be talking about those. But at the same time as we talk about those, we need to we need to include in that conversation a spending cap and a and a, a constitutionalizing the PFD to take the PFD off the table uh, as a, as as supplemental uh, revenues for government. Um, I think that's the right. I, I think that's what I think that's the usefulness to take away out of Jenkins' piece. The part where he says we can avoid a tax uh, just is just isn't true. And, right. and and we and and you know people want to say that, uh, but it's just not true. Well, um, and and we need to wrap our heads around that. But at the same time as we wrap our heads around that, we need to be talking about uh, spending caps, permanent spending caps, and constitutionalizing the. PFD. Well, and again, I think these things need to happen before we put these taxes in place, because otherwise it'll never happen. We've got to constitutionalize the PFD, take that cookie jar off the table so they can't reach into it, and we have to have an effective spending cap before we open the spigot on these new revenues, because otherwise, I mean, you know, again, von von Imhoff the other day, what we get all these new revenues, what are we going to spend that money on? I mean, come I on. I think they have to happen all at the same time, Michael. This this nine hundred million dollar a year deficit isn't going away, and we don't have the the reserves. We don't have the savings uh, to be able to fund it. So it's I, I to me it's got to happen all at the same time. It's we we need to come to grips with what kind of tax we're going to use, what kind of revenue approach we're going to use to raise the money to to handle the nine right. hundred million dollars well, and layer on. The 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 uh, the constitutionalizing the PFD and the spending cap. And would you agree that if we don't have those two things in place, the constitutionalization of the PFD and the spending cap, then we'll be in an even worse situation? I mean, based on a track record of what the legislature's done in the past. I don't agree with that for for this for this reason. Uh, I don't agree in the short term for that for this reason. I think Governor Dunleavy, for all of his faults, I think he will impose an effective spending cap. Uh, uh, through vetoes, and I think there are 16 in the legislature to back him up on those vetoes. Longer term, uh, I think there's a concern because if you, if you don't have, if you have somebody like Walker back in there, or even Sean Parnell, God love him, um, I think I think that resolve uh, 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 may dissipate, and I think any revenues may be used incrementally as opposed to as right. a substitute. Right. But I think I think during Dunleavy. Uh, I think during Dunleavy, we've got an effective cap in, in terms of the veto. Uh, Brad, have you seen um, Natasha von Imhoff's HB, SB, rather, 75, the new, an act relating to the duties of, alleg of legislative finance relation to an appropriation? It's a spending limit bill relating to the budget responsibility of the governor and providing for an effective date. Have you seen this yet? I've not. I've uh, I've I've looked at. I spent time looking at the governor's proposed constitutional amendment on uh, spending caps, but I've not looked at Natasha's bill. Okay, somebody was asking about this. If you have, uh, if you have uh, um, uh, analyzed it yet, I hadn't even heard of it, and I'm just now looking at the um, 
Uh, I'm just now looking at the uh, the the language of it. Um, as some restricted general fund appropriations made for the fiscal year may not exceed six billion dollars by more of a sum of six billion multiplied by seventy five percent of the cumulative change of inflation and six billion multiplied by twenty five percent of the cumul. This is all about this is. <laughs> This is an appropriations limit based on spending, basically. When it's all so, that sounds that sounds like a lot, a lot like her bill last session, which yeah. would make which would make sense. Yeah. So yeah. it looks like a revamp of her last bill. So, all right. Well, uh, maybe if you want to take a look at that sometime in the near future, Charlie was asking about it in the chat room. Um, yeah. There's two. There was two issues with her bill last session. If they're if it's the same thing, one is it, it started the number started way too high. Um, and then it, it, as you said, it was based upon spending. So it just sort of escalated itself off into, into oblivion, sort of like our current constitutional amendment. Right. Right. Okay. Um, let me see what else is in there. There's a lot of Harold in the chat room today. He's, he's never a happy man, but today he's verbose. Um, uh, censure, blah, blah, blah. What can non-residents, what can we do about non-residents? Who is an example work on the slope, fly in and fly out with the income that maybe a resident could do? And I know that that was part of the discussion that you had um, in, I know nobody wants to talk about the flat tax, but the, uh, the in your flat tax, I mean, that's part of the issue is that you capture a portion of that. Now, there is some kind of limitation on that, that if they live in another state that already has some kind of income tax, yada, 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 but it would capture a portion of the out-of-state income. Am I wrong? You're exactly right, Michael, and that's that's one of the serious problems with the, that's one of the reasons that PFD cuts are so adverse to the to the Alaska economy. PFD cuts only come at, come out of the pockets of only Alaskans. Only Alaskans are are paying for uh, government when you use PFD cuts. Unlike you know in other states where they have non residents or visitors pay a portion of the cost. Uh, PFD cuts because of the because of their nature only come out of the pockets of Alaskans. And if you if you have another a, a broader system a broader tax system that includes all income or includes all uh, uh, sales or includes all of uh, uh, of something of whatever whatever you're going to tax uh, a portion of the tax. Uh, a portion of government cost is paid by non-residents. Uh, ICER estimated, uh, depending upon how you how you do the t uh, the tax, between seven and ten percent of the cost of government would be borne by non-residents if you uh, if you had a broader basis. So, no, it's a, it's, a, it's exactly right. It's one of the reasons that uh, that uh, the PFD cuts have such a large adverse impact on the economy relative to. Uh, to uh, other approaches, uh, revenue approaches, you just you don't get any you don't get any contribution from uh, from non-residents of toward the cost. Matty has got a question in the chat room that I think is good. Here's my question for Brad: When taxes are talked about, why is it more often than not income taxes rather than a sales tax? Now, Brad just broke down why basically all taxes are income taxes in the end, but why are they more often than not talked about income taxes versus sales taxes? If the only option is income tax, it leaves an entire population of people out of the solution uh, to the problem. Why not talk about a sales tax instead? Not only would everyone pay a percentage, even tourists and travelers from out of state, I never hear a sales tax in an option, and I find that curious. She says, I prefer neither. But uh, there, there's the question for you. Well, income taxes don't mean it don't necessarily mean that a large part of the population don't pay taxes. It's how you structure the the, in, uh, the the income tax. When we talk about a flat tax, we talk about a tax that all Alaskans would pay, all Alaska families would contribute the same percentage to, uh, regardless of whether you're in the bottom 20% or the top 20%. You, you would pay the same percentage. You would have the same skin in the game. So simply when you say income tax, that doesn't mean – uh, that uh, that a large part of, part of the population are, because most is being left out. most people think of progressive income tax as in right. what you pay the federal government and only what forty seven percent or something pay none of those taxes of workers or people in the United States but but but, that, but, but that's not the only kind of income tax right exactly I mean, right you, you can you can structure it the the reason people don't talk about sales taxes the reason I don't talk about sales taxes is they're regressive in the same way that PFD cuts are middle and lower income Alaska families pay more. Uh, as a percent of their income through sales taxes uh, than they do uh, under other forms of taxes. The reason is a sales tax has this big exclusion. 
and the exclusion is for money saved or invested uh, in, in other endeavors, not spent, not, not spent in consumption. Middle and lower income Alaska families have a, spend, uh, consume with a lot more of their dollars than upper, uh, the top 20% do. And so the, on a percentage basis, the top 20% pay a relatively small amount of their income when you, when you, when you use sales taxes as opposed to middle and lower income Alaska taxes. It, it is, I've, I've, ICER has done the analysis on that. It says the sales taxes is the second worst uh, uh, for middle for Alaska families uh, behind PFD cuts. It has the second largest ad adverse impact on the Alaska economy behind uh, behind PFD cuts. It's because they're regressive uh, it, it is the reason that people usually don't talk about them. But it's not you don't have this choice between uh, it, we're not stuck in this choice between sales taxes on the one hand, PFD cuts, uh, and progressive income taxes on the other hand, which it, as Maddie says, raises the question whether you leave people out below. You can structure a tax that has all Alaska families contributing equitably, all having the same skin uh, in the game. And eight states have flat taxes uh, already. Federal government doesn't, uh, uh, but eight states have uh, flat taxes that to varying degrees include uh, include large portions of their populations uh, in uh, in the tax structure. So it's it's not get your mind take your mind out of the structure of it's only the federal style or sales tax or something else. We can develop a tax like eight other states have. We can develop a tax uh, that is much more equitable than either approach. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to number three, which, of course, is the organization or disorganization in the House. Uh, again, we're getting conflicting stories. Uh, Stutz is saying that uh, Merrick is with her in the majority. Merrick is noncommittal. They couldn't get 21 votes on procedural stuff this morning uh, or yesterday. Uh, so, I mean, what, what what's your take on what's going on in the House organization? They want I mean, if you if you if you listen to what Merrick's saying and what Stutz is saying, they want a bunch of Republicans to come over and, and join them in a bipartisan caucus, a truly balanced caucus that uh, that would that would address these issues uh, together. And, and that has some merit. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that makes me very skeptical about about all of those words. The committee on committees that got appointed yesterday doesn't have any Republican leadership uh, on the committee. You don't see a, a, a Steve Thompson. You don't see a Bart Lebon. Uh, you you don't see anybody from uh, the Matt Sue on the committee. Here's 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 the committee on committees that got appointed. Louise Stutz is chair. Bryce Edgman, Chris Tuck, Neil Foster. Okay, that's that's the that's the the the, the current coalition as as one half of it. Here's the Republicans who are appointed: Kelly Merrick, Sarah Rasmussen, and Mike Cronk. Um, you don't have a Kathy Tilton. Uh, you don't have a you don't have a, a George Rauscher. Uh, you don't have a Steve Thompson. You don't have a Bart Lebon. If you were truly trying to get a bipartisan uh, a coalition that that brought in Republicans as a full and equal party partner in that, I would have expected to see a Kathy Tilton, a Steve Thompson, uh, uh, and 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 others. Other than Kelly Merrick, who uh, is a is a sophomore, if I recall correctly, Sarah Rasmussen, who I think is a sophomore also, and Mike Cronk, who's a, who's a freshman. Um, all I mean, all nice people, but this isn't the leadership of the Republican Party, right? Of the of the Republican Party in the House. No, they put in the JV team instead of the varsity team, is what they're basically saying. And so I I have my I'm I'm skeptical about this about this goal of having a true uh, bipartisan effort. Well, and again, I, I this is what I was saying earlier on. I mean, if, if they can't even, if we can't even organize the House in this regard, and I know people out there, including myself, are saying we've got to make these cuts. If we can't even organize the House at this point in a meaningful way, how are we ever expected to reach the $400 million in cuts that Dunleavy is proposing or anything else? I mean, we can't even, we can't even work our way out of a wet paper bag at this point. Yep, exactly right. Which, I mean, it, even if we have the four hundred million dollars in cuts, we've still got a nine hundred million dollar, a billion dollar hole uh, that we have to fill. But, uh, uh, but, I mean, we, we are <laughs> one more time. We are going to have taxes, um, uh, and 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 the question is, what kind of taxes we're going to have? 
Uh, and and the question is, you know, what, whether we're going to whether they're going to be um, uh, good taxes or bad taxes. This is th- this simply ensures, I think, <laughs> that we're continuing down the road of frankly having higher taxes because right. we're not going to make the, even the four hundred. I'm sorry, cuts. you just said good taxes or bad taxes, and I'm just like, what? There there are good taxes out there. I mean, it's a oh man, there's a whole show wrapped up into that argument right there. Well, but- there's be- there's better. There's better tax structures than right. other tax structures. The least worst option is what we've been saying. That's what I've been saying anyway. The least worst option. Uh, about a minute and a half here, Brad. Um, your final thoughts on where the legislature goes from here. Look into your crystal ball and tell me what happens in the House. Uh, in your mind, as you look at this, what's the best and worst case outcome? Um, I think that I think the outcome, the most likely outcome, is that uh, a few more Republicans bleed over into the majority. Uh, it looks like Sarah Rasmussen, who's a good friend with Kelly Merrick, uh, maybe Mike Kronk, who has uh, who, who uh, agreed to serve on the committee on committees. Uh, maybe uh, maybe they go over. I don't think the full body of the uh, of the Republicans go over. I think uh, Ch- uh, uh, Speaker Stutes missed an opportunity when she named Kelly, Sarah, and Mike uh, to the committee on committees instead of Kathy Tilton, Steve Thompson. Um, uh, and uh, and another part of uh, of Republican leadership. Kevin uh, Kevin McCabe in the chat room just said Kronk did not agree, nor was he asked. Neither is going to the committee on committees. This may this just we need, may just be looking at another week or two of stalemate as this thing moves forward. Um, which again, shocking, but uh, I guess well I don't know how shocking. I guess not surprising. It's in some ways shocking in other ways. Final thoughts, Brad Keithley. Um. It's going to be. It's going to the the next few years. The next next few months are going to be uh, a challenge. Uh, where the challenges are piling up, uh, we need to be thinking about how we're going to respond to those challenges instead of just sticking our head in the sand. One of the responses is going to be we are going to have revenues. We need to be thinking about the right way to structure revenues uh, to uh, have the lowest possible impact on the Alaska economy and and Alaska families. Uh, Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend, for coming on board. As always, it's good to talk with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank you so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.